So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my group. So I am a professor, as it said, of health research and policy and medicine. And I have a lab called the Healthy Aging Research and Technology Solutions Lab, which is HEARTS. So we like to be known as the HEARTS Lab. And so what, uh, just to sort of situate our lab for you in the School of Medicine, since it's a little confusing where everybody sits, um, we're part of what's known as the Stanford Prevention Research Center, which has been around for about 45 years. It's a world leader in chronic disease prevention and control. Um, that center is a division in the Department of Medicine here at Stanford Medical School, which obviously is part of the uh, seven schools that make up Stanford University. So here is a, a snapshot of my lab at least part of my team, and we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about the three major themes that we focus on, and uh, hopefully um, these will resonate uh, for you, and uh, we, can we will have a question and answer period after the presentation, which I'm really looking forward to. That's the fun part. Uh, for, for speakers like me. So our, our three major themes include clinical studies for healthy aging. So I'm going to start out with an example of that. Health promoting information technologies, even for people like me who hate technology and are, are not very good at technology, um, I'm going to show you some easy peasy things that we're developing in, in my lab that anybody, even if you don't like technology, could use. And then finally, our overarching theme is really about healthy communities, healthy environments, and health equity. And so I'll be presenting some of my work and our lab's work on that as well. So unfortunately, this is sort of the traditional view <laughs> on aging. And so what my team's goal is to make it look a little bit more like this. So this is where we're heading, and this is what our passion and our mission is. So starting with theme one, which is uh, promoting healthy aging, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a, a great study that was just finished about a year or two ago um, that is focused on helping people to maintain their independence, physical and cognitive function and quality of life. Um, when you ask people as we age, what are you most fearful about? They don't say cancer. They don't say heart disease. They don't even say diabetes. What they say is losing my independence, becoming a burden on my family, not being able to engage in all of those daily activities and things that bring me joy. Um, so that is one of the major themes of our lab, is how can we do research that's going to help inform everyone on what we can do to maintain our independence. And a great example of this is, a rec is the recently completed study I just mentioned called the LIFE multi-site trial. And the question that LIFE was trying to answer was, can regular, moderate physical activity prevent or delay the onset of mobility disability. And when, what is mobility disability? It's simply the ability to walk sufficiently well to maintain your independence. Walking is key to that. Um, so unfortunately, when you look at the US population, over 90% of, of Americans uh, over the age of 60 or so are not engaging in sufficient numbers or amounts of um, aerobic or endurance physical activity and muscle strengthening activities. And we really need both of those to run through life's finish line in the most healthful way that we can. So here are the life field centers. So this was funded by the National Institutes of aging, of health, of the NIA, so that it was the National Institute on Aging. And uh, there are eight centers, and the first thing you're going to notice is what? They're, they're, they're all east of the Mississippi, except 
for us lonely Californians out here at Stanford. And so we're essentially anchoring and representing the western half of the United States. <laughs> and I have to say, this is not atypical in National Institutes of Health research. If you look at a lot of these large multi-site trials, you'll see them piled up sort of on that eastern seaboard. And so it's very important that us West Coast universities carry the flag for California because what we find is that there are regional differences as you might imagine and Californians were a different breed. Westerners generally are a different breed. So we were proud to carry the flag for the Western United States. Um, so the life participants that came into the study were 70 to 89 years at the beginning of the study. They, they were sedentary or insufficiently active, meaning that they were doing less than 20 minutes per week of structured physical activity. Um, they were able to walk about a quarter of a mile or 400 meters, but they were already starting to show some impairments in walking, leg strength, and balance. So they were at risk for losing their independence. So we randomized them to receive an aging-friendly physical activity program, which consisted primarily of walking two days a week, of mild to moderate intensity strength training that people can do in their own homes, as well as balance and flexibility exercises, or a successful aging health education group, which got lots of great information, but nothing really about physical activity per se. So what did we find? After three years, we found that there was a significant reduction in disability, a 20% reduction in mobility disability among the group that was doing this kind of physical activity. So that's the first take home point. If you ask me, Jeff mentioned you know, the elixir of life and we're all looking for that. And I have two words and this is, this is like stealing my thunder. You could probably all move to the next session after I say these two words, uh, which is move more. And it's funny, because Dick Van Dyke, who's in his 90s, when he was on a talk show uh, over the past year, and, th and they asked us, he looks great. I don't know if you've seen Dick Van Dyke recently. He just looks great. And the host asked him, what, what keeps you looking so well and so healthy? And he said, move more. <laughs> I move. I, I don't just sit. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the second theme that my lab does, and we're very excited about this theme because in many ways this is the future of health and Stanford is a world leader in this, has to do with harnessing information technology to promote health for all as we age. And you know we're all familiar with information technology, even though I have to say this is a breath of fresh air that I'm looking out in this lecture hall and I see your eyes. <laughs> I see that, that, that's an epiphany. So oftentimes we see the tops of students' heads and we don't see their eyes. And that's why we're excited about the kinds of um, technologies like Google Glass that sit up here away. And the Google engineers told us that they developed Google Glass specifically because this one engineer was so tired of seeing the top of his son's head and he hadn't seen his son's eyes in like two years. So he really wanted to put the technology away, you know, up above so that you could still have conversations and connect with people. So information technology gives us real-time information capture. It gives us personalized program delivery and information, what Stanford calls um, precision health. You know, in, uh, when President Obama unleashed this new initiative, he called it precision medicine. Stanford has augmented and expanded that into precision health because we know prevention and wellness and well-being are key parts of the equation. And finally, uh, information technology gives us population reach 
and impact. We can reach into parts of populations all over the world that we've never been able to reach before. And I'll talk, talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in that area. So I'm going to talk about two IT domains this morning. One is I like to call the me domain, or the it's about the individual's own health and behaviors, and the second, the we domain. So in terms of meat domain technologies, um, we have telehealth, we have virtual advisors, and we have smartphone platforms. And I'm going to give you examples of all of those kinds of things that we are testing here at Stanford. So telehealth by computer really is trying to answer the question, can automated systems actually replace human advisors in being able to promote, promote health behaviors like regular physical activity? So you're probably thinking, well, what does this automated advisor thing look like? Well, think about the last time you got a message from your pharmacy that your medication was ready or something was ready for pickup. That's an interactive voice response system. It sounds like a human. It's got a human voice, but it's completely driven by a computer. Um, the other one has to do that I use a lot is the airline reservations number when you call United or American or any of these airline reservations. Um, you will get a human sounding um, computer. And you know I'm like this with the United uh, guy, he knows me. I put in my little pin and he says, Welcome, Abby. And I feel like I've bonded with him over the years because I fly so much. Uh, you know, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these automated phone systems. So we did the first study called Chat, where we put that kind of interactive voice <coughs> response system head to head against well trained phone, human advisors. And what we found, so the automated advisors are in red and the human advisors are in black, and statistically there is no difference between these. It didn't matter, even though the middle-aged and older adults who were inactive at the beginning of the study, when we asked them before we started what would they prefer, 85 to 90% said a human. I need a human. Don't, I cannot do this computer thing. Well, we randomized people. That's the heart of science, scientific inquiry, so we don't get bias either from us or from participants. And lo and behold, it didn't matter that the people did just as well through 18 months with this automated advisor. And the great thing about automated advisors, they don't get hurt, you know, their feelings hurt if you don't pick up the phone, if you hang up on them, if you want to call them at 2 a.m. You know, they, there's a lot of advantages of these kinds of systems. Well, so right now, we're expanding some of this research um, through the Women's Health Initiative, a national, the largest national study of women that's ever been done. Uh, do we have anybody in here who's a WHI? Participant? Okay. Um, so Stanford's one of the leaders in, in that study. Uh, the women have been in the study for 20 years. And so 23,000 of these older women we are targeting to help them increase their physical activity, and we're offering them as one of their um, support systems these kinds of interactive voice response systems, and we'll see how, how they do. And so far, so good with that. So another side to technology is preventing the widening of the health disparities gap, or what people call the digital divide, that's oftentimes due to things like language issues, reading skill levels that may be low, um, computer access that may be difficult for um, a lot of people in the community, and lower health literacy levels as well. And so there are virtual advisors that you can use that provide tailored, personalized interactions via both simple verbal and nonverbal communication. So unlike the telephone, not only can you hear this type of virtual advisor, you can see her. And here she is. This is our virtual advisor. Her name is Carmen. Um, we developed Carmen 
um, as a partnership with this, the computer scientists at Northeastern University in Boston. She's culturally adapted in particular to Latinos and Filipinos. Uh, she's bilingual and you interact with her simply by touching the screen. So when participants, participants interact with Carmen, she's just on a monitor when you walk into the room. There's no mouse, there's no keypad, all of those confusing things that people don't like. It's just you and Carmen and you can talk with her. She'll give you some uh, offerings of things that you can talk with her uh, about. And so here is one of our participants in uh, a San Jose community center having a talk with Carmen. So Carmen is state of the art in the sense that I'm a clinical psychologist by training and so we made sure to program into Carmen all of those great evidence-based behavioral strategies that we know work across health behaviors in helping people to improve their health behaviors. And lo and behold, four months later, Carmen did a great job of being able to help these very inactive older adults walk more. And these older adults, most of them had never touched a computer before. So they didn't think of Carmen as a computer. They thought of her as someone that, that was a help to them, an advisor. And in fact, at four months, when we asked our participants who were working with Carmen, what did they think about Carmen? Because Carmen, unlike the interactive voice systems that I was mentioning on the phone, they speak with a human voice. Carmen sort of speaks with a little computer ease voice. She's not, it's not a human voice. It's definitely a little computer Ask, and we were a little worried about that. You know, how would, how would they feel about it? Well, what we found is that they felt very strongly that Carmen cared about them. They felt close to Carmen. They trusted Carmen, and they wanted to continue to work with Carmen. And so what happened is at the end of four months, our National Cancer Institute grant was done. And so we went back down to the community center in San Jose because we had to remove the monitor because it's Stanford equipment and you know how that goes. It has to come back to Stanford. Well, the participants said, no, <laughs> you cannot take Carmen from us. You have to leave Carmen here. And we said, oh, OK, <clears throat> we're going to leave Carmen <clears throat> with you. And so all of a sudden, this controlled experiment became a natural experiment because they all knew the study was done. And so the question was, would they continue to use, they didn't have to use Carmen for the study's purposes. 95% of them continued to use Carmen over the next uh, five months period. Um, so we think Carmen has, as we say in the biz, has legs in terms of being able to potentially really <clears throat> try her out in other places. Um, based on this study, we got a National Institutes of Health grant from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to actually test Carmen longer term uh, in more community settings. And in this study, we're putting Carmen head to head with humans. So it's your classic smackdown. On one side, we have Carmen. On the other side, we have some wonderful trained peer advisors. They're volunteers from the community, from the local community, who uh, are active themselves and want to give back. And so you may think, we're going we're gonna to pitch to you, if anyone's interested in this, to come talk with me, because we have lots of opportunities in our research for community resident participation. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we're very excited about this study. It's finishing up this summer. And then we'll be able to see what happened. But the most important question actually isn't which is best, Carmen or the humans. It's which program works best for whom, right? So the goal is you're all different. 
Some of you may do great with Carmen. Some of you may hate Carmen and not do well. Others of you may do great with a human, and still others may not do well with humans. This is what we found in the chat study. So the goal is to be able to develop a whole complement of different programs that help you to stay healthy. And those programs, and we can better match you. So it's what we call the witch's conundrum. Which programs for which types of people over which periods of time uh, work best? And you can think about these kinds of virtual advisors in a number of other settings. They don't need to be just limited to the community settings that we're working in now all around uh, the, the peninsula. Uh, and the South Bay, you could think of them in clinics and pharmacies while you're waiting to pick up your medication and libraries, work sites, schools, et cetera. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to another technology, smartphone apps. The, the sort of um, the love-hate relationship we all have with our phones. So how many people use apps on a smartphone? <laughs> Here we are in Silicon Valley, okay. And how many use health apps in particular? All right, okay. So this part of it is for you all, which is everybody, because almost everybody has them. So we know, you all know that there's a huge number of apps out there that assess physical activity, nutrition, a whole variety of things. And they have built-in sensors, so they have accelerometers that are built into your phone. And if you wear your phone, put it in a pocket, even sometimes carry it you know, in a purse or wear it, it can, it can give you some information on how active you've been over the day. And it, and it usually will provide you with some real-time feedback. That's great. Um, however, few of the apps that are on the current markets actually allow um, other kinds of evidence-based strategies that we know that work. We know that there are at least 25 to 30 behavioral strategies that can work, and it's very rare to see them built in to the Silicon Valley smartphone app market yet. And so we were very interested in trying to tap these different motivational frames for being more active, walking more, and sitting less. And so we developed three different kinds of apps. The first app is this one. The, uh, we call it the analytic app. This is sort of a classic facts and figures app. And this is what is most popular when you go to Apple Store or Google Play or all of these app stores. They look sort of like this. They give you feedback. There's usually figures and data and information in them. And that's great, but not everybody resonates to these kinds of facts and figures. So for them, we've developed uh, an app called the Affect Play app. And as you can see, there are no numbers on this app at all. What you see is a little bird avatar. And the bird avatar reflects with, through his behavior how active or how sedentary you've been throughout the day. So if you've had a very active day and you glance at your smartphone, your little bird avatar will be flying. If you're really active with goggles and give you a thumbs up, um, and uh, he'll beat a United jumbo jet, and he's much more polite than United, so <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, and he'll show up in all kinds of interesting places. He'll pop up in Paris. He'll pop up in Buenos Aires, you know, Argentina, all, all around the world. So uh, he, he's sort of um, pulling from the user more of this nurturance sort of thing, taking care of this bird uh, sort of motive. Um, the third app is a combination of the two. It's a social app. And it focuses on all of those social motivations that all of us have, collaboration, cooperation and support, and competition. And so these are avatars as well of you and a virtual team, team one. And then there's another team, 
team two that you're not a part of, and you see all of the information about how active everybody on those two teams are throughout the day. And when you get feedback in this app, it's always embedded within your group, and, it, and you can always see what the other group is doing. So just out of curiosity, if you had to choose, show of hands, how many people think that they would choose or do best with the analytic app? Let's see the show of hands. Yeah, this is sort of an engineering science crowd. <laughs> OK. Um, any people who would like the bird? All right, OK. <laughs> And the social app, how about that? OK. It's interesting, because when I present this around the world, different audiences like different things. So I go to Germany, it's the analytic app, hands down. I go to South America, it's the bird app, interestingly. And a lot of people like the social app, too. So the first study we did was to really just ask people how their activity changed, their walking changed across a several month period. And you can see that all three apps were able to get um, some increases in physical activity by self-report, but in particular the social app and the affect app actually did better. And these are midlife and older adults. Most of them have never really touched smartphone apps. They were not tech savvy. And that, again, is the goal of my lab, because I figure if folks who aren't used to these kinds of technologies can use them, anyone can use them. So we did an experiment using the built-in accelerometer of the phone. And we had a control group. So we were also randomized people to getting one of those three apps, or the control app, and we found that it was actually the social support app that did the best overall and did better than the other apps. Now what's interesting though, for the other two apps, the Bird app and the Analytic app, there were changes, but there was a lot of vari more variability in people's response. In other words, some people, you know, most everyone who got the social app liked it and could use it. Wasn't the case with the Bird app and the Analytic app. Some people loved the Analytic app, some people hated it. Some people loved the Bird, some people hated it. So that's really what's going on here. And it's this which is conundrum question that I think is the most important question. Which app for whom? Not which app does better overall, but which app for different types of people? When we looked at sedentary time, because sedentary behavior is, there's a growing evidence base, you've probably heard this, about sitting too much. And that is becoming very clear, that you can be very active during your day, but if you're also spending eight to nine hours sitting during your day, that has independent health effects that are not good. Um, so what we found is the social app, again, did better overall in increase, or decreasing um, sedentary time. And the social and affect app did really well in terms of self-reported sitting time, how, how much people felt that they were sitting. So you know, the take home message here is move more. And now I've added two more to my two, sit less. OK, so if you learn nothing else this whole day, as you're wandering around Stanford learning these things, just remember those four words. Uh, move more, sit less. Whoops. Could you show us that social? I'm not sure we understood it. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, uh-oh, Kevin, I've had a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> um, I guess this one was on my... Is this someone that was just, yeah. yeah, it looks a little tangled up. OK, so unfortunately, I'm just giving you a taste. You know, this is a smorgasbord, not a sit-down dinner or breakfast. So think of it, you know, I can just tantalize you a little bit, and we're not going to have time to go into it in, in too much more detail. But uh, we'll, we can talk more during the question and answer period. OK, so I presented some of this individual level um, research, and I'm going to give you some take-home points from it, and you've already heard some of those take-home points uh, from me. Um, when it comes to physical activity, 
it's very important to remind yourself that something is better than nothing. There is no threshold in physical activity, even though we tell people, oh, try to do at least 150 minutes a week, that's the national guidelines. There is no threshold. If you were active, if you walked five minutes a day today and you doubled it to 10 minutes a day, you're going to get benefits. So this is the lovely thing about physical activity. It's unbelievable in terms of how many different parts of your body it touches in a positive way. We were built to move. And so we're really going against our, our natural na nature, really, by spending so much of our time being sedentary. And it's particularly important as we age that we keep moving. Um, it's never too late to get health and well-being benefits by increasing your daily activities even a bit. We worked with nonagenarians. Some of my colleagues have worked with 90-year-olds who were in wheelchairs in nursing homes and led them through some very simple strength training activities. And those people, almost all of them, improved, some of them to the point that they could get out of their wheelchairs and start to walk again. So it's never too late. It's important to keep regular track, though, of your activity levels uh, in the easiest way for you. So some people like a step counter. I love my little step counter. Uh, it's simple. It's, it's inexpensive, 15 to 20 bucks. And it just counts my steps. And for me, it's, that's much better than trying to go into an app and seeing all their graph. I don't want that. I just, just tell me the steps that I did, and then I know at the end of the day if I need to do some more. So, but some people love the app. Some people love a calendar, writing down what you're doing on a calendar on your refrigerator. All of that's good. Um, set realistic goals. So we don't set a goal. You know, and this goes with the tracking. You need to track what you're doing and then set a realistic goal for improving it. Uh, as I said, reduce time sitting throughout the day. Get up and move around a bit at least every 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And because I'm practicing what I preach, I'm going to ask everybody just to stand up because we've been sitting for 35 minutes. OK, and move a little stretch. OK, that's good. Do a little whatever, um, macarena, uh, whatever, you want, whatever you want to do. OK. It helps, doesn't it? It helps, yeah, I agree. What we do at a lot of conferences these days is we have people stand if they want to. And it's wonderful, stand, you know, walking meetings, standing you know, on the side. I invite people if they want to do that. Just don't stand in front of your neighbor. But um, you know, do that and go to the back and stand. That's absolutely fine and healthier for you. OK, now i got to get you to sit down again. <laughs> Sometimes that's the hard part. OK, and then finally, tell others about your plans um, and seek their support, as we just found out. Social support, very important. You don't need to have people actually walking with you. You know, support by just telling them, this is what I'm trying to do, and have them send you little prompts and, and texts and other things is great. OK, so now we're going to go up to the we domain, which is my special passion these days. And in particular, I'm going to tell you about our work in empowering people just like you to be citizen scientists to assess and advocate for healthier neighborhoods and communities. So how does local neighborhoods, how do local neighborhoods and environments matter as we age? Well, we know that neighborhood features play a, an important role in healthy aging in place, which for many aging adults is critical as we age. Um, one of the most important numbers, you're going to be hearing lots of health numbers today as you walk through the different venues and sit in, in different things. I may be the only one that's going to give you this number, though, which I think could be claimed to be among the single most important numbers that are specific to you. And that's your zip code. What? Your zip code. Yes. Where you live. The characteristics of your neighborhood affect 
things in an independent way in a huge, significant way in terms of your health and your well-being. And I'll just give you a little touch. Um, people, depending upon your neighborhood, may have less access to healthcare innovations and services. Living where local inequalities are, income inequalities in neighborhoods where there's lots of inequalities, that leads to a lot of stress and strain, which is bad for your health. Um, so a lot of people have neighborhoods that have fewer resources like parks, libraries, community centers, and that is associated with greater cognitive decline as we age and more barriers to making healthy choices in different neighborhoods. So um, neighborhoods differ on what's known as neighborhood walkability. How easy it is, are there sidewalks? Can you cross the street without killing yourself? <laughs> um, can, are there destinations in your neighborhood that you want to walk to, that you can walk to? And the same is true with healthier foods. Is there access, access to healthy foods? So we've done studies around the country. This is the Senior Neighborhood Quality of Life Study, or we affectionately call it SNICKLES, because it's so much fun to say. Um, and what we've looked at is over almost 800 older adults, 66 and older, uh, living in Seattle, King County region of the country, and Baltimore, Washington, D.C. region of the country. And we've looked at them by different types of neighborhoods that they live in. So some live in high income neighborhoods, some live in low income neighborhoods, some live in high walkable neighborhoods. Some live in lower walkable neighborhoods where it's, where it's more car-centric and less pedestrian-centric. And what we find, first of all, this is showing you body mass index, one of the better indicators of people's weight status. And your BMI is simply weight over your height squared. And what we find, first of all, is that if you're in a lower income neighborhood, your chances of being overweight are greater than if you're in a higher income neighborhood. That is seen throughout many, many studies. Um, but what's very interesting is that um, even despite this income, neighborhood income level, irrespective of that, if you live in a higher walkable neighborhood, your BMI is less and your physical activity is more. So this walkability issue in your neighborhood is very, very important. So one thing we've been trying to figure out is how do we promote healthier neighborhoods uh, in, through citizen science? So citizen science um, is a centuries-old American theme. Um, you know, dating back to Thomas Jefferson, who was doing it in terms of um, weather observation. So today there's three general types for the people I call types of citizen scientists where you're donating um, biological specimens for medicine, and Stanford is at the forefront of this. Um, it's a very popular form of citizen science. There's one with the people that involves active data collection. This is where we count things in our backyard, the, uh, the great Audubon. It's usually ecology oriented, and for instance, the great Audubon backyard bird count that happens every November. And what we do is citizen science by the people, where we get residents involved right from the beginning in participating in setting objectives, collecting and helping with data collection and interpretation. So they don't just send the data on to a scientist. They sit with us to help interpret the data and build solutions. And so we have what's called the Our Voice Citizen Science Healthy Neighborhood Projects that use simple technology that we've developed to help residents identify neighborhood features that help or hinder active living and healthy eating. And the residents learn how to prioritize these issues. Um, they learn how to build community partnerships with stakeholders that can help them change things in their neighborhood and advocate for change with these people. Um, so the, the Our Voice process starts with the use of our app, which is called the Stanford Healthy Neighborhood Discovery Tool. It's a very simple mobile app that allows residents to walk around their neighborhood, 
take photos of the things that really are problematic for them and to narrate their story about why they took that photo. What is it about that location in their neighborhood that's problematic? Um, so let me just move to the map. So the goal is to create a map, and this is a map of East Palo Alto with the senior housing site that was in East Palo Alto. Um, this was our first project with the citizen science, and you can see where residents walked and where they took photos, and you can click on the, the audio and listen to their in their own voice about what it was about these locations that really was hurting their health. The East Palo Alto seniors identified a number of things, including safe crossings and paths to public transit. And so they worked with the local um, East Palo Alto authorities to work on traffic calming and improved access to public transportation. But that wasn't all. They continued to have, because they were empowered to now they knew, hey, I can make a difference in my neighborhood, in my community. So they've been continuing to work with um, the city officials. And uh, beautiful things have come to pass in East, East Palo Alto be up because of this, including their voices were incorporated in a senior advisory committee resolution in East Palo Alto. Um, the city reviewed the streetscapes and pathways around the senior housing site to help make that safer for walking. Um, they also improved access to the local senior center that a lot of the seniors couldn't get to. Um, the seniors themselves developed a senior community garden. And not only that, they then sought out the local nonprofit organizations that could help them how to do that really well and to cook the things well that they were growing. And then finally, the city implemented a sidewalk uh, inventory and repair program. So this was our first step of this. And we were so excited about what came out of East Palo Alto project that we've now taken it on the road. And we have a worldwide global citizen science research network for healthy living. And it is fascinating that you see some differences between Israel and Mexico, but what's more exciting is all the similarities in what people want from their neighborhoods. Uh, it, it's incredible. So the blue are the projects that are, have already been finished or are ongoing, and the red are the, all the ones that are being planned. We had our first inaugural meeting at Stanford last November, and we're having another one this fall. So what can you all do in this area? So as you can tell by all of our research, that we really depend on and value the local community members as partners in research. Uh, for example, as research participants. You know, the, the, the NIH is the world leader in science. And it's, it, there's a single reason for that. It's not because we have the best scientists, even though we probably do. But I mean, that's probably not the major reason. I think the major reason is because residents are willing to volunteer and partner with scientists to find the answers that we need. Um, so in addition, and I should just mention, we're, all, we're looking for older adults right now who want to try out some new, really cool Silicon Valley techie gadgets with us and give us their opinion. So if you're someone like this that likes to come and try a few things, it's not a lot of time, um, let, let me know. We actually have a sign-up sheet here for anybody who wants more information about what we're doing. The second way, as I mentioned, is through community volunteers, where we train you to become a, a peer mentor or to engage in other ways with our research. So as I just mentioned, if you're interested, I have a sign-up sheet. And this isn't to sign you up. It's just if you want to learn more, that, that would be great. And the, we also have an email address as well that we can give you if you want to lear learn more about what we do. Because everything we do is community engaged and partners with our residents near and far. So conclude, our passions are to further explore the power and possibilities of citizen science, health IT, and community partnerships to extend the reach and impact for all. As you can see, we act locally, but we're thinking globally 
and how can we reach these things beyond borders around the world. And with the ultimate goal of helping everyone, regardless of age, maintain sufficient health and vitality to continue to contribute and engage in personally meaningful ways. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. OK, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Can I put the email address back up? I'd be delighted. Um, let me get that. There it is. I'll leave that up there. Excellent. It's D Esparza, D-E-S-P-A-R-Z-A, at Stanford. Yes? What have you discovered in your research in cultural differences amongst different participants in the community? So what have we, in the US, you mean? So, what have, so the question was, what have we discovered about cultural differences? And um, we've discovered that they're important in the US, obviously. Um, people have different relationships with their neighborhoods with their communities, with their families. And so we do a lot. This is where the partnering part comes in. We're not going to ride into a neighborhood without really trying to understand what it is about that neighborhood and that culture that can help inform us. So this is where the partnering becomes very, very important. There are some cultures that, you know, where family is first. And there are other cultures where, where it may be a little less. Um, there's language issues with cultures. And so we always make sure that we have people who are bilingual on my staff. So everybody on my staff speaks Spanish. I'm learning. I'm not very good, but I'm trying. But everybody else is, is fully bilingual. And in Chinese as well, we're building um, our competencies in Chinese as well. Yeah. Yeah, so the question had to do with, you know, what parts of this type of research focuses on mind, spirit, connections. I'm really glad you brought that up because something I wasn't able to present today um, is our wellness initiative. We have a wellness living laboratory initiative that's going on. And, and in that first tent, when you walk out the door, and you, you go to your left and you'll see the tents. The very first one, there's a booth there. And I strongly recommend people who are very interested in mind-body, in wellness, and well-being, and spirit, and other kinds of things um, that need to be studied. Um, should go ahead and vis visit the Wellness Living Laboratory. There's all kinds of initiatives that they have that residents can get engaged in. One in particular is a registry, a well-being registry for the Bay Area, where we need everybody to sign up to tell us how they think about well-being and what's important to them so we can fashion the right kinds of um, science to address that. So thanks for that question. Yeah. Uh, just follow on to his question. Yoga and meditation mm -hmm. has been creeping up in the Western society for the last two decades. Yeah. Have the Western doctors approved that or not? Yes. Um, we ourselves have done studies looking at yoga and Tai Chi mm -hmm. versus Western exercise. And what we find is you get benefits from each type of activity. So, uh, and in particular, our study on Tai Chi indicated, you know, good impacts on flexibility in particular, on pain management and things like that. And so the goal is to find the right physical activity that you will stick with. That's the single most important thing, um, is to really think about what do I enjoy, what can I do. That's the physical activity you should be doing. You know, because they all, you can get benefits from all of them. Yes. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Instead of going home and can't do anything. Right. So did everybody hear the question about, um, you know, especially if you're busy and you're working and you need places to exercise, I think we all have to become sort of mini scientists to think about where are the places that I can walk? And sometimes those places are not in your neighborhood, as you're pointing out. They may be at your local school. They, they may be at your work site. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them already have teams already on the fields that you can go to. But is it possible that in neighborhoods they can incorporate walking paths and things of that yeah. nature? Right. So she's asking about, you know, and this is what our citizens, this is exactly, thank you, what our citizen science initiative, our, our voice initiative is all about. It's working with local residents to be able to empower them to take data with their phones, you know, on this app, because nothing speaks at a town council meeting like a little bit of data from a resident. We've presented things at town council meetings all up and down the peninsula. <clears throat> the town council members, the city council, they they're very polite. They don't listen to scientists. You get one resident up there, and especially if the resident has some data. Here's a map. We can't walk here. Yeah. This is dangerous. <clears throat> we need more lighting. That's what I think can make the difference. And we're lucky we live in a country where, where we can reach our local councils. So for instance, in Mexico and parts of South America, they don't, they can't. There's nobody to take their issues with. And so what we found out down there when we do this kind of research is that the scientists become really important because the Mexican local governments will listen to scientists, unlike here. <laughs> there they'll listen to scientists. And so we had to reinsert the scientists back into that equation. So for every area, every region, it can be a little different that way. I have one more question. And that way we have a, a person who's standing, yay, in the back. I want to give her a chance because she's had her hand raised. Thank you. Yes, I work in corporate wellness. So I was curious what you have seen in your research or would recommend for long-term behavior change, and then with that, how do you maintain that motivation for those participants? So if it is an app, how do you get them to continuously use that tool to mm -hmm. maintain that behavior change? So the question was, she works in corporate wellness, how do you get people not just started on a health behavior change, but to maintain it and to use some of these things? And that is the million dollar question in behavioral science, and I have to say we don't have the answers yet. We have, and it depends on the individual, but some of these behavioral strategies that I've talked about are very important in terms of the social support. Finding things that people enjoy, realizing that physical activity is a, dare I say it, a life sentence. In other words, you're not gonna, you can't just do it for a month and then it, you're cured. You know, it's something we have to do throughout our lives, which means things change for us. And I think where a lot of people get, get stuck, and this happens around New Year's, you know, we all make resolutions, we're great for the next three weeks, and then something happens on, at work or illness or something else, travel, and um, then we fall off the, you know, we stop and we get demoralized and we say, oh, I'm not an exerciser. So what we're t we've been trying to develop are things to get people back on the horse. And the first thing is to realize you're, it's going to ebb and flow. You're not going to be an exerciser every day of the week. You're not going to be able to do it. Life happens. And so it's very important for people to take that long range view and to have something prepared when it does happen, when, they, when things um, get stopped in their lives. And so we pre help, it's called relapse prevention training or preparedness. We prepare people for stops in their um, physical activity. So that, that's very important is thinking ahead. Okay, you know, during Christmas season, I know I'm not going to be active. <laughs> it's just going to be too hard. Okay, that's okay. But let's make a plan for January about what you're going to do. So there is a lot of evidence out there. The trick is to be able to individualize it to each individual. And we're working on that. And I'm hoping apps will actually be the solution because they, they can start to sense you, sense what you're doing, and give you real-time suggestions. 
So that's where we're working uh, towards. We're not quite there. And I think one more question. Oh, did you? Okay, well, can we, can we, just because you've had your couple of questions, <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, we had to finally take the computer out of the community center. So it, I know, but it had a Stanford tag on it, and that means it has to come back. Um, so um, they could have very well. And this study we're doing right now, it's a year-long study. Um, so that will at least tell us across a year how much activity and participation with Carmen they do. So you, uh, young man, Chris, yeah. yeah, you get the last question. Yes. Uh, back from Erby, as you know, Silicon Valley, we live in a very structured life. Many of us go for a couple of hours in the fitness center, run, weightlifting, and then we eight hours on the computer also. Is that lifestyle has to change? Yes. So what he's saying is, um, you know, we, we get in our exercise, a lot of people, and then we sit for eight hours. And what we have learned, and you're just going to keep hearing more about this, um, is that sitting is not healthy for us. Extended sitting, extended sitting, where you're sitting for more than an hour at a time. You know, we need to probably get up, I would say, at least every hour, walk around for five minutes. You don't have to do a lot of stuff, but to just break up that long, that prolonged sitting is very, very important. Um, so, and maybe one more question, <laughs> and then we probably do need to stop. I think so. I, I'm looking towards, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it will be online yet if you want to review it or share it with friends. Yeah, okay. Well, so, thanks again, everybody. So